Starting back in the Ford and Nixon administrations were two aspiring White House staff advisors named Dick and Don, who worked, among other things, on a highly classified top-secret program called Continuity of Government, or COG, which developed government contingency plans to protect and preserve the executive branch of government in the face of any imaginable threat or event. Literally, their job was to sit on these think tanks with a panel of military geniuses and dream up the worst possible doomsday scenarios imaginable, and then gather detailed intelligence on how the mechanisms within government would protect the president and vice president in the event of such scenarios. These scenarios included things like nuclear bombs exploding in the hearts of major U.S. cities, foreign land, air, and sea invasions, domestic terrorism, and airplane hijackings with every imaginable end scenario they could possibly think of. By the time Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld took over the White House in early 2001, they would both possess three decades worth of expert knowledge on the entire U.S. defense system, including a large range of defense planning scenarios, as well as the entire repertoire of military and radar defense systems. That type of intelligence would be extremely dangerous if placed in the wrong hands, and there is good reason to believe that it was placed in the wrong hands. Both Dick and Don were also members of another think tank called the Project for the New American Century, or PNAC, which consisted of neoconservatives and military-industrial complex bigwigs. Prior to 9-11, PNAC published a document called Rebuilding America's Defenses, which outlined a 100-year plan of massive military expansion and empire building worldwide. The authors wrote that the process of transformation is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. In early 2001, this group of well-connected insiders were looking for an event. They understood that the best way to get people to go to war is to convince them that they are under attack and then rally them against a common enemy. The Cold War had ended, so the arms market was flat, and with no real threat or enemy, the military-industrial complex was at an all-time lull. Although the public reacted with shock and fear when 9-11 happened, the reaction in the financial world was much different. It was business as usual and a lot of industry insiders were actually quite pleased. Fifteen years later, and trillions have now been made off the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, Dick Cheney's Halliburton alone raked in $69 billion from the wars created by 9-11, while Donald Rumsfeld and his friends and business associates made their own fortunes in defense and counterterrorism investments. One of Donald Rumsfeld's business partners, Peter Jansen, ran a company called Amec Construction, which was just nearing the completion of a $258 million refurbishment, including the installation of blast-resistant siding and windows, in Wedge 1 of the Pentagon, which just happened to be the same wing that terrorists would attack on 9-11. One of the biggest questions people need to ask about the Pentagon is, how did that plane fly through miles of restricted airspace to strike the most protected building on Earth nearly an hour and a half after the first reported hijack? Well, it turns out that Dick and Don changed the shoot-down policy a few months before 9-11, and then according to Dick Cheney's own documents and timeline from 9-11, he had an active stand-down order in place on Flight 77, which prevented a shoot-down and thereby enabled the attack on the Pentagon, which otherwise could never have happened. Our defenses would have shot that plane clear out of the sky if the policy to do so hadn't been directly altered by Dick and Don just months before. The policy was changed back after 9-11, but the damage was done. Also curious is why terrorists would crash into a non-crucial wing of the Pentagon which contained an office of the Army named Resource Services Washington, which lost 34 of its 45 employees. Most were civilian accountants, bookkeepers, and budget analysts. This was the very day after Donald Rumsfeld announced that $2.3 trillion had gone missing or stolen from the Pentagon budget. That's right, terrorists just so happened to attack a location in the Pentagon where analysts were working to help track down that missing $2.3 trillion, and the ongoing construction projects in that wing had moved those offices closer to the impact zones. The company that performed the remodeling, AMAC, was also given the contracts to rebuild Wedge 1 of the Pentagon after 9-11, as well as contracts to clean up Ground Zero after 9-11. Even though AMEC employees had been doing construction in that very same wing that morning, surprisingly no AMEC employees were killed in the attack, which killed 125 Pentagon employees. AMEC was never investigated or even mentioned by the 9-11 Commission despite raking in well over half a billion dollars in government contracts directly resulting from 9-11.
The national security and intelligence establishments also benefited greatly from 9-11 since the USA Patriot Act jump-started the massive expansion of warrantless surveillance, wiretapping, and mass data collection. Therefore, it would certainly have been in the best interest for the NSA, FBI, CIA, and national security establishments to go along with the official story and not call things into question publicly. Even if they had inside information on an inside job and could expose it if they'd wanted, they'd be risking nearly everything to do so. The same goes for every top official in the chain of command within the military, NORAD, and the FAA, which all coincidentally failed to do their only job on 9-11. All the systems in government that should have been in place to stop something exactly like 9-11 not only failed to work on 9-11, but appear to have been intentionally disabled or used against us by the people in charge of protecting us that day. No one was investigated, fired, or otherwise held accountable for these failures. Some, in fact, received promotions and special honors. The head of NORAD on 9-11, Ralph Eberhardt, helped sponsor a series of military exercises codenamed Northern Guardian, Northern Vigilance, and Vigilant Guardian, which served to obstruct Northeast air defenses on 9-11. Eberhardt also appears to have lowered the Infocon, or communications defense level, just hours before the attacks, and gave orders that directly obstructed the interceptors, sending the last remaining fighter jets far out to sea to fight an imaginary Russian fleet. Eberhardt was an expert on air defense and communication systems. He could have stopped 9-11 in its tracks had he simply done his job that day. But he wasn't alone. Mike Canavan, the FAA hijack coordinator, decided to go on an extended coffee break that morning and was completely missing for hours during the most crucial moments of the attacks. Benedict Sliney, a former Wall Street lawyer, was placed in charge of the FAA. His first day on the job was September 11th. As a lawyer, he clearly understood the strength of plausible deniability as a defense strategy, as he and his colleagues all feigned inexperience and surprise as their official excuse for the so-called failures that day. Threat. No specific threat involving uh, really a domestic operation or involving uh, what happened, obviously, you know, the city's uh, airliner and so forth. There uh, were uh, no warning signs that I'm aware of that would indicate this type of operation in the country. CIA covert operations always operate under a blanket of plausible deniability. Intelligence agents use it to cover their tracks at every step of the game. It's a key tactic used in the intelligence community, and it was also used as the official excuse by everyone in charge of protecting us that day. I don't think anybody could have predicted that they would try to use an airplane as a missile, a hijacked airplane as a missile. Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings on such a massive scale. So was 9-11 a covert operation? Right before 9-11, the entire FBI counter-terrorism task force was flown out to Monterey, California for a company retreat, so all of our best agents would be on the other side of the country from the events unfolding in New York and Washington. FBI Director Louis Free left the Bureau shortly before 9-11 to begin a new career in law. One client he would later represent in 2009 was none other than Prince Bandar bin Sultan, the Bush-connected Saudi ambassador who it is now known helped finance several of the 9-11 hijackers in California in early 2001. It appears that there was tampering and complicity within the top levels of the FBI, and former Director Free appears to be a central overseeing figure. According to whistleblowers, the Able Danger Terrorist Tracking Program had become suspicious of the activities of several of the men who would later be identified as the 9-11 hijackers and had raised multiple alarms within the DIA, CIA, and FBI, which were strangely being blocked or purposely ignored by higher-ups within the chain of command. One FBI agent who was actually the world's leading expert on Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda at the time quit his job in disgust and outrage after his reports on possible terrorists receiving flight school training in Florida kept being ignored. John O'Neill would later be killed in the 9-11 attacks themselves just three weeks after starting a job as head of security at the World Trade Center, a role he was still being trained for at the time. John O'Neill's history within the FBI, particularly his investigations into state-sponsored terrorism, are enough to make anyone suspect that his accidental death in the World Trade Center on 9-11 may have in fact been a murder and a cover-up for what he knew. O'Neill would certainly have had a lot to tell us about bin Laden and al-Qaeda 
and whether or not they could have actually pulled this attack off alone, and he was an extremely credible witness. Unfortunately, O'Neill was unaware of everything that was going on inside the towers leading up to the events of 9-11. After the World Trade Center was bombed back in 1993, they needed to assess all the damage and hire contractors to repair the floors and trusses destroyed by the blast. It just so happens that the firm that performed this work, SPC Tridatacorp, was managed by none other than the comptroller of the Pentagon on 9-11, a guy named Dov Zakheim, another PNAC member and well-known intelligence community insider who also interestingly did top-secret work on a technology that could take remote control of hijacked commercial airlines by uploading commands to their flight management computers with an augmented series of GPS waypoints that the plane's autopilot could then be forced to follow and once hacked, disable the manual override switch, forcing the plane along any route desired by the comptroller. That technology was active and in place on all four aircraft used on 9-11. Although such technology should have made 9-11 virtually impossible for the hijackers, it could have also been used internally to ensure that everything went according to a different plan. Anyways, in order to address the damage from the 93 bombing, SPC Tridatacorp was given access to all the engineering blueprints for the towers. Around the same time that this was going on, a very curious company named Securecom was given contracts to redesign and upgrade the electronic security systems in the World Trade Center. Securecom changed its name to Stratasec after it was sued by another company of the same name. Securecom Stratasec very curiously held its annual board meetings in suites owned by the Saudi Arabian Embassy and one of its board members happens to have been none other than Marvin Bush, the president's own brother. Stratasec also just happened to have security contracts with United Airlines and Dulles International Airport on 9-11, where Flight 77 into the Pentagon was hijacked out of. At Dulles, Stratasec managed airfield access and electronic badging, as well as the security video system that later provided unique and critical evidence implicating the alleged 9-11 hijackers. Why a security company which had contracts with nearly all the different 9-11 crime scenes would hold its annual meetings in offices owned by a country that is now purported to have financed 9-11 is anyone's guess. Stratasec CEO Wirt Dexter Walker III from the Herbert Walker line is a very curious character. No public images exist of the man anywhere on the internet, and his career history appears to consist of jumping from one CIA front company to the next. Aviation General, Glor Forgan, Kuwaiti American Corporation. Wirt and his wife made pre-9-11 stock purchases which were flagged by the SEC after 9-11 as suspected insider trading but they apparently never followed through on their investigation. Nor did the 9-11 Commission think to investigate Stratasec. Wirt Walker's activities are similar to two other known CIA operatives, Ted Shackley and Robert Sensi. All three men had unusual business relationships with Kuwaiti royalty and were involved in aviation and security operations. Stratasec's corporate operating officer, Barry W. McDaniel, was a former material arms distributor for the Army Corps of Engineers. He also has black ops on his resume through his affiliation with Sears World Trade, the Vinyl Corporation, and BDM International with Frank Carlucci of the Carlyle Group, an investment firm heavily tied to the military-industrial complex. Frank Carlucci also worked closely with Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld back in the Ford and Nixon administrations and was an old-school State Department black ops guy. After 9-11, McDaniel would start a police state supply company with Dick Cheney's old business partner, Bruce Bradley. Stratasec also managed badging and video surveillance at the World Trade Center from 1993 all the way to 2001, almost a decade of unrestricted security access to those buildings. In May of 2001, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which technically owned the World Trade Center complex, lost a 10-year court battle with its insurance companies, leaving it to fund a $1 billion asbestos removal project with money it didn't have. Two months later, real estate tycoon Larry Silverstein, for some reason, decided to purchase the aging liabilities and promptly insure them for billions of dollars, just in case of total destruction by terrorists. 9-11 happened just six weeks later, and Silverstein was awarded a $9.2 billion settlement, which more than compensated him for the loss of his buildings. 
At 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 slams into Martian McLennan's secure computer room on the 93rd floor of the North Tower. One of Marsh's executives, L. Paul Bremer, happens to be chairman of the National Commission on Terrorism, an old-school neocon and former Kissinger aide who worked alongside Dick and Don back in the Ford administration. Bremer, for some reason, decides to skip work in the towers that day to visit an MSNBC television studio, where he is the first person ever to begin pointing the finger directly at Osama bin Laden and Iraq, calling for the, the most severe military response we can come up with. After 9-11, Bremer would become the Iraq occupation governor, literally Saddam Hussein's replacement in Iraq, and one of the prime architects of the Iraq war. Bremer also sat on the board of the Komatsu Dresser Mining Division back in the late 90s when it developed a thermite plasma charge which could, quote, demolish steel and concrete structures with high efficiency without secondary problems due to noise and dust. Dresser merged with Halliburton in 1998. Bremer also sat on the board of international paint company's management firm, Axo Nobel, which developed a spray-on fireproofing insulation for skyscrapers called Interchar. In the years leading up to 9-11, several of the floors in the area of the impacts were renovated and remodeled, and many received complete fireproofing upgrades. Forensic evidence of thermite was found and confirmed by multiple scientists using uncontaminated World Trade Center dust samples and extreme persistent heat levels were reported by the FDNY and World Trade Center cleanup crews. All strong evidence that high temperature accelerants such as thermite were used to assist in the destruction of the towers. The government even suppressed original news videos of the New York Fire Department making multiple reports of large explosions and secondary devices inside the towers on 9-11 as well as videos of the cleanup operation where a red-hot smoldering pile of fused steel and concrete burned underground for three entire months, and firefighters reported flowing steel like you were in a foundry. Then in 2009, scientists found the smoking gun by analyzing samples of World Trade Center dust that had been preserved since 9-11 and found that the dust contained tiny flakes of unreacted thermitic material, as well as a large number of iron-rich microspheres or afterproducts of a thermite reaction. Multiple labs have now confirmed it. It was definitely there, it wasn't natural, and it didn't get there by accident. The debris pile also displayed evidence of high-order damage, which under the National Fire Protection Act required officials to test for the use of explosives or incendiaries. Surprisingly, this was never done, as the FBI, FEMA, and other federal agencies claimed control over the crime scene and began shipping all the debris to a landfill off of New Jersey, where it could be sorted and scrubbed clean before analysis and storage. Although normally the FBI would take great care to preserve a crime scene and collect as much evidence as possible with minimal disturbances, the exact opposite happened with 9-11. Everything was cleaned up and destroyed as fast as possible. The frantic search for survivors and bodies proved to be the perfect cover, even though they stopped finding people alive after only the first few hours. William Rodriguez, the last man out, only survived because he dove beneath a fire truck as the towers collapsed. Toxic dust clouds filled the Manhattan skyline and were picked up on satellite images from space. The damage seen on 9-11 was so massive, it's hardly fathomable that two airplanes could have caused that much devastation. The Twin Towers had 47 core box columns in the center of the floor plan, which carried nearly the entire structural load of the buildings. All the stairwells and elevator shafts were also located in and around these columns, which, once inside the elevator shafts, one would have complete total access to the entire core of the buildings. With all the unoccupied floors in the towers, it would have been a cinch to covertly rig the Twin Towers with explosives once inside those elevator shafts. Around the same time Stratasec took over security at the World Trade Center in 1994, Ace Elevator Company won contracts at the World Trade Center over the larger and more well-known Otis. Seven years later, just a few months before 9-11, Ace elevator workers began a full-scale elevator upgrade for both towers. The elevator shafts gave access to the main structural steel for the building and would have been a perfect opportunity to install demolition devices all over the entire core of the building, completely hidden from sight and unknown to workers and occupants within the towers. When the planes struck the towers, 
all the Ace Elevator employees mysteriously vanished instead of helping to operate the elevators and evacuate the buildings as they would typically do in emergencies. Like Stratasec, Ace Elevator also went bankrupt and dissolved shortly after 9-11. Turner Construction, a huge mafia-connected construction firm in New York, did a lot of work inside the towers in the years leading up to 9-11, including several complete fireproofing upgrades on the same floors that would be hit by the airplanes on 9-11. The fireproofing in these areas was applied double thick, so cordage could have easily been hidden beneath or even covered devices on key trusses. The final charges could have been placed and wired up the weekend before 9-11 during those unusual power downs and evacuations that were reported. The controlled demolition hypothesis is not outside the realm of possibilities once you've done the research. Especially when one considers Building 7, the third World Trade Center building which mysteriously collapsed late in the day on 9-11. World Trade Center 7's tenants included the FBI, Secret Service, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, which investigates stock market and securities fraud. In 2001, the SEC and World Trade Center 7 was investigating Enron and WorldCom, the two largest security scandals of the time. Enron was a Madoff-style pyramid scheme, a fraudulent energy company which helped bankroll the Bush-Cheney run for the White House with over $2 million that it stole from its investors while Bush and Cheney used office to deregulate the oil and gas industry in Enron's favor, starting as the governor in Texas and then moving to the White House. Luckily for their pals at Enron, everything required to prosecute those massive financial crimes was destroyed when World Trade Center 7 came crashing to the ground late in the day on 9-11. Now, the government and a few stubborn defenders still try to hold on to the theory that Building 7 was somehow this anomaly in steel-framed high-rise building construction, as it is the only skyscraper that has ever suffered total spontaneous collapse by fire in 100 years of skyscraper construction worldwide. It fell through the path of most resistance at the rate of gravity. Now, the government lies all the time. The physics of freefall? Not so much. The top floors cannot fall through the entire structural resistance of a building as fast as they would free fall through air. Yet even NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, was forced to admit that Building 7 did in fact fall at free fall acceleration. Random fires and even serious facade damage caused by the North Tower collapse cannot cause a building to fall so symmetrically and suddenly straight into itself at the rate of gravity. Multiple physics and engineering papers have been written on this subject and past peer review. There is obviously another answer for why World Trade Center Building 7 collapsed the way it did on 9-11, and why the government continues to ignore it and pretend it knows nothing about it. Donald Rumsfeld has been asked what he thought about Building 7 more than once, and his responses have been most unusual. What is Building 7? I have no idea. I've never heard that. <laughs> Never heard of Building 7. No, I haven't. You have seven. The I gotta go. <laughs> How could Rumsfeld not know about Building 7 when he and Dick Cheney were former board members of Salomon Smith Barney, which was by far the largest tenant inside of World Trade Center Building 7, with offices on all but 10 of the 47 floors, over 1.2 million square feet of office space. Donald Rumsfeld served as chairman of the SSB International Advisory Board since its first meeting in 1999, but had to resign in 2001 when he was confirmed as Bush's defense secretary. Cheney also resigned from the board upon becoming Bush's vice president around the same time. So Donald Rumsfeld obviously knows much more about Building 7 than he pretends to. There was one major reconstruction project that took place inside of World Trade Center Building 7 prior to 9-11 that we know of which could have served as a time window for the planting of demolition devices. The construction of the Office of Emergency Management, built by Mayor Rudy Giuliani on the 23rd floor. Months of renovation work on multiple floors were required to build this full-scale FEMA safe room and control center, which had its own independent air and water supply, as well as blast-resistant siding and windows. Directly overlooking the entire World Trade Center complex, it was positioned to have a bird's-eye view of the scene. However, on 9-11, the OEM Command Center in Building 7 was never even used. Building 7 was evacuated at 9 a.m. that morning. Giuliani had insisted on setting up this bunker in Building 7 and went against all advice to place his command center there. 
Although the perfect vantage point to oversee an attack on New York City's number one terrorist target, it was apparently a little too close to the action, and Giuliani was advised to abandon it, and he instead spent the day walking around the streets around Ground Zero with the fire and police commissioner and a flock of reporters in tow. Giuliani's first orders to the media and officials were to evacuate all of southern Manhattan south of Canal Street. Police Commissioner Bernard Carrick, Giuliani's right-hand man on 9-11, would later be convicted of felony fraud and conspiracy charges and serve four years in prison for an unrelated case. Carrick's department was also the one that found that remarkably undamaged hijacker's passport on the sidewalk after the plane struck. Was that evidence manufactured and planted there, or did it really survive a plane crash and a fireball? World Trade Center 7 was the first to be cleaned up and removed from Ground Zero, despite the excuse that they were trying to find bodies. Over a million gallons of water and a special fire-quenching liquid were sprayed on the rubble in the first week just to cool it down enough for excavators to go to work. Meanwhile, the government told all the workers that the air was safe to breathe, when it wasn't, and now 15 years later, most all the people who helped destroy that key 9-11 evidence will soon be expunged from the 9-11 record as well, as they all die of lung-related illnesses. No one would have talked. No one would have come forward. All the most elite financial institutions in the United States, the military-industrial petroleum banking intelligence complex, all benefited massively from 9-11 even if they weren't directly involved, and most probably weren't. The masterminds of 9-11 understood that these powerful institutions would all benefit from the wars and panic created by 9-11, and would be very unlikely to throw away potential profits by calling any part of the official 9-11 story into question. Moreover, these institutions own and control the mainstream media, and have been using their influence for the past 15 years to condition the American public against any alternative views of 9-11, fill the debate with conjecture, disinformation, and nonsense, and give everyone a horrible first introduction to the worst 9-11 conspiracies with the least credible evidence, while keeping the most crucial facts and information from ever reaching the public mind. For the most part, they have been largely successful at convincing a majority of people that our trillion-dollar defense system was overcome by just 19 Islam-inspired terrorists in their early 20s, armed with only cell phones and box cutters, working for a guy in a cave on kidney dialysis and a small but growing Al-Qaeda network. And despite 15 out of 19 of the hijackers being from Saudi Arabia, and newly declassified evidence showing that the government knew high-ranking Saudi government officials helped fund the 9-11 hijackers, for some reason, Saudi Arabia is still our ally, and we instead attacked Iraq and Afghanistan. The underlying details of that Saudi alliance are only beginning to emerge. For instance, we now know that the hijackers had financial help from Prince Bandar, sometimes called Bandar Bush, because of his close friendship with George W. Bush. Bandar gave $130,000 to two of the hijackers in California. Other wealthy Saudis in Florida also provided support according to those 28 newly declassified pages from the 9-11 Commission, which the government covered up for 15 years. Why the government would protect these wealthy Saudi 9-11 co-conspirators is anyone's guess, but it's probably because they do not want the public to realize that larger involvements actually existed behind those hijackers and that those wealthy Saudi financiers and enablers connect back to certain high-ranking members of the Bush administration, their private investment firms, and intelligence networks whose fingerprints appear to cover nearly every single aspect of the 9-11 crimes. From the financing of the hijackers, to the security at the airports where the planes were hijacked out of, to the interceptors and air defenses which failed to intercept those planes, to the security at the World Trade Centers and their primary tenants like Marsh and Solomon Smith Barney in Building 7, to the rebuilding in Wedge 1 of the Pentagon, and finally, back to the military-industrial complex and the national security state that has been expanding its sphere of power and influence in this country for the past several decades and would have more than welcomed an event like 9-11 and the massive war funding and no-bid contracts that they all benefited from as a direct result. They stood to make trillions while also greatly expanding government power and providing an endless excuse for war in countries with plentiful and highly coveted natural resources like oil, lithium, and opium. So many powerful institutions benefited so greatly from 9-11 and its aftermath, and yet people wonder how an inside job could have been covered up so long. 
Well, please tell me who in power or the mainstream media would ever want to expose this. Please. Some people still can't get over the question of why they destroyed their own buildings. Sure, they take some losses, more so the taxpayers, donors, and volunteers who did most of the cleanup, but just consider the circumstances that existed at the World Trade Center leading up to that fateful day. The SEC was closing in on two of the largest security scandals of the time, both Enron and WorldCom, who had all their files and evidence inside of Building 7, which would eventually lead to Bush and Cheney facing a massive scandal ruining any chance of re-election and possibly leading to impeachment and federal indictment. The Port Authority was already facing the asbestos problem in the towers and would have been eager for an easy option out. The least expensive and easiest solution to all of these problems would be to find some way to demolish the buildings in some type of accident or grand disaster. The idea of terrorists flying planes into the towers wouldn't have been that far of a leap. In fact, Donald Rumsfeld's RAND Corporation buddy Brian Michael Jenkins thought of the idea and included it in his list of possible risk scenarios for the World Trade Center in a report that he wrote for Kroll Associates back in 1994, after the 93 bombing. Kroll, like Stratasec, played a key role in the World Trade Center security apparatus in the years leading up to 9-11. Kroll's director, Jerome Hauer, was also conveniently not in the towers that day, and instead called into several television stations to give the media some expert advice on terrorism and what should be done in response. Hauer also downplayed the theory that explosives were used to bring down the buildings, saying that fire and structural failure caused the collapses. Howard would later manage the government response to the anthrax attacks which targeted U.S. senators who were pushing for an official investigation into 9-11. Those senators quietly backed off and the Bush administration was successful at stalling the investigation into 9-11 for over a year while evidence was still being destroyed. After 441 days, the Bush administration finally opened an official inquiry into 9-11, headed by a Bush insider named Philip Zelikow, who had previously helped write the preemptive Iraq war invasion strategy with Condoleezza Rice, and was already completely on board with the Bush agenda in Iraq. Zelikow once published a paper on the creation of public myths, fitting for his work on the 9-11 Commission, which wrote its conclusions and summary first, and then tailored its investigation and evidence to fit the official theory rather than following the facts and evidence to see where they might actually lead. The condensed summary given in this video barely scratches the surface of where that investigation should have gone and what it should have uncovered, if it wasn't compromised from the very start. The individuals and organizations outlined in this short summary were uncovered using good old-fashioned crime scene-based detective work. These are not theories. These are core facts and evidence, which you will never hear discussed in the mainstream media or any of the 9-11 propaganda and disinformation films we've seen so much of in the past. As always, do your own research, draw your own conclusions. For more information and sources, visit 911insideout.com. Thank you for watching and helping to spread the truth.